we pray again as we uh, begin the service together? Father, we are so grateful to gather together again now for this last session of trying to pull some things together and uh, think through implications and applications to our lives. <clears throat> we thank you for the great God that you are and for the privilege it is to be your people uh, made in your image and redeemed by your Son, empowered by your Spirit to be remade like Christ. And we long for the day when we will be with Him. But until then, we know that you call us to be faithful day by day, uh, to grow day by day, uh, to encourage one another day by day. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us even now to think together about things that will help us to do that, to be the people of God in ways that would bring honor to your name and great uh, growth and edification to your people. So toward that end, we pray that you would be at work and accomplish what only you can do, Lord God. I recognize I cannot. Uh, you must work in our hearts, all of us, in order to, to benefit from what we will look at. And we will give to you all the praise and the glory for all of it will, will have been done by your grace. And so we thank you in advance and pray these things in the name of our glorious crucified, risen, and reigning Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, we are looking now at uh, this final session of the five of them uh, that we've looked at through the, the weekend together, beginning with our creation in the image of God, then to the fall and what happened because of sin, uh, moving then to our redemption in Christ and the renewal that is uh, undergoing, that we're, we are undergoing right now, uh, the final consummation of that that will happen when Jesus comes again and we enter the new heavens and the new earth. And uh, now this session is more for the purpose of uh, wrapping things up, uh, putting, putting some things together for us. It is not a typical sermon. I mean, just for any of you who are uh, wondering about that, I know that. Uh, you know, I normally teach from a text and work through a text. Uh, this is not that. This is a thematic approach that is re really uh, an attempt to take the conference as a whole that we've looked at and, uh, and tie it up. So uh, I, I hope it will be helpful to all of us as we think through that. I hope you have the handout, uh, Session 5, Implications and Application of Human Life in Creation, Fall, Redemption, and the New Creation. And again, I have three sections that I'm going to work through with you, as I have had through the whole series, uh, three main emphases. And here, just take a look at those with me, the Roman numeral points, so you can anticipate what we'll be looking at. We'll begin with the necessity of a God-encompassing framework for a correct understanding of human nature. So really, understanding God rightly and who we are before Him is just absolutely essential in, in getting a right view of, of ourselves and, uh, and how we should live our lives. So we begin with that God-encompassing framework. Then we move on in Roman numeral 2 to the necessity of a Christ-centered framework for a correct understanding of human nature, realizing that God's purpose in creating us was to unite us with His Son, this was the purpose from the very beginning. And you can, you can hear that in the words of, of uh, Romans 8, 29, whom he foreknew, he predestined to what end? To be conformed to the image of his son. So indeed, the Father has designed everything that takes place for the purpose of seeing us uh, made like Christ, united with him, and, uh, and, and to see Christ over all as he reigns over us and us with him forever. So we really do need to have a Christ-centered framework. But then third, the necessity of a gospel-dependent framework for a correct understanding of human nature. You could even say a grace-centered, a grace-dependent uh, framework. That is, we realize none of this can happen apart from the gospel of Christ, by, by which we are brought to newness of life, by, by which we are forgiven of our sins, by which we await the consummation of all things. So, uh, God-encompassing, Christ-centered, gospel-dependent uh, framework for understanding uh, the, the doctrine of human nature. So let's just take through the, these uh, four categories that we have looked at over the weekend of creation, fall, redemption, and new creation, and think through each of these broad categories. So first, the necessity of a God-encompassing framework. Think with me about creation, first of all. 
Isn't it clear that the creator-creature distinction provides the necessary framework for a Christian worldview? We cannot understand this world as it actually is apart from understanding God who exists independent of the universe, who did not need the universe that He made, but provides everything to this universe. So we are creatures. God is the creator. He is eternal. We are temporal. He is infinite. We are finite. Uh, He is omnipotent. We are dependent, weak, and needy, dependent upon Him for all that we have. So to understand who we are, we have to understand God and His independence from the world that He has made. And you just think how sad it is in our day how many people are trying to understand the world in which we live apart from God. And it it is impossible to do that rightly, impossible. So if you don't have God, what do you have? Well, you have us figuring out ourselves what we ought to do. And there really is nothing that guides human reason. It ends up being what we are seeing today with our sort of relativism or totalitarianism, uh, anarchy. I mean, just all these different things that we are seeing played out among us in the very culture in which we live are the, are the effects of denying the, God, the, the creator-creature distinction the creator-creature relationship, that we are under authority as we are under God. We owe God allegiance because He is God. That we are called to follow His will and His ways because He is God. So indeed, all of that, we realize, is absolutely necessary for a correct worldview, a Christian worldview. And then secondly, image of God requires the primacy and ultimacy of of God in correct understanding of man. God has designed who we are, and we are not at liberty to reconceive or redesign ourselves. So here's another element of the world we live in. I mean, I just think how much has happened just in the past few years that, ha- that have brought these things to the surface in, in, in such relief, with, with such boldness. This attempt now to, to, to define ourselves as we want to be, define our own gender, uh, define, define our own uh, identity and, 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 uh, uh, and place that we have in this world. And how dare anyone think that they can tell me who I am. But indeed, this is just so wrong-headed because indeed God is the one who defines who we are as those who are made in the image of God, male and female. So the image of God and our sexuality and genderedness that comes out of that is all by the design of God. To reject the design of God is inevitably to lead to the destruction of who we are the harm and the ruin of who we are. So here, as Christian people, we realize what's at stake in this. We have to uphold what is true, the way God designed us, and and, uh, be voices that encourage others to see the same and to to, uh, uh, accept and embrace these truths as their own so that we can live human lives in the way God intended them to be lived. We are not at liberty to just define for ourselves who we think we are. We bow before our Creator who designed us to be exactly who we are. So God, God's role in creation as the Creator, the Designer, making us in His image, those are things that are central to understanding rightly who we are as humans. You know, one more thing just comes to mind by way of application here. I I do think we have misunderstood race in that we are all of one race. We we use race, I think, in ways that really don't fit the the teaching of the Bible. We all come from Adam. We we, we all have one common human race uh, that is distinguished, yes, by different ethnicities, uh, different cultures, uh, different skin colors, and all the rest, but we are one human race. So there is no distinction among us between black or white, between Asian, between uh, uh, Latino. We, We are all one human race. And this is heightened all the more in Christ when we realize that as we come together as Christians, our identity as, is as one man, as Paul would put it in Ephesians chapter 
two. One body, as he would put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We are united together as one in Christ. From every tribe and tongue and people and nation, as, as we read in the book of Revelation. Indeed, one in Christ. So, the world may not get this. In fact, how can they? How can they? But should we get this? Oh my, we should. We have to get this. We have to realize that by putting an emphasis on race, what, what we call racial, I've just said it's not an accurate way to describe it, but, but it's how it is described today, to, be, to put our emphasis on racial, cultural, ethnic distinctiveness as what is primary misses it and, and, and fa fails to see how glorious is the unity that we have in Christ that makes those differences pale in comparison. I have experienced this many, many times in traveling internationally. I can remember a time that I was with a group of Vietnamese, you won't believe this, but it was when I was 15 years old, so you just have to accept it as true because it is. Uh, I was 15 years old in Vietnam during the, during the war, and I was with a group of uh, Vietnamese, South Vietnamese Christians who had just been de devastated by Viet Cong soldiers. And I gathered together with them, with a missionary with, with whom I, I was visiting them, and we had this worship service, and it was just, the, it's one of the most incredible memories in my, of my life, is this worship service that we had. I had a translator who translated everything for me, so I understood what was going on. But the unity I felt with these people who love Christ, who, who are persecuted for the name of Christ, uh, who, who are worshiping God, with their whole hearts, in the power of the Spirit, the unity there was with people I have never known before, of a different, different ethnic, a different national identity. But our commonality in Christ is what unites us. I know many of you have experienced similar things when you, when you visit Christians overseas or someone from another culture comes here and they're a Christian and, and the automatic unity we have. So indeed, Realize this is what God intends us to, to do, is to celebrate that about us which unifies us first and foremost. It doesn't discount the other elements, but it does make them secondary, does it not? I mean, Paul did appeal to his Roman citizenship. So yes, indeed, there, there's a time and a place for that, but that's not what is central. Oh, no. So let's get this in the church and commend to the world a picture of unity that, would, that they would look at and go, wow, how do they do that? How do they love one another, though they are different culturally, ethnically, and, and the like? Oh, how they love one another. May God help us. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> then the fall <clears throat> is also deeply affected by the... the, the uh, the role of God in all of this. Sin in the fall is seen as disobedience to God. The essence of sin, as we thought about this together, is the urge for independence from God. Those three different aspects that we looked at together, the hedonist urge and the covetous urge and, and the, the prideful urge, those are all elements of this urge to want to go our own way. This is what sin does to us, right? Well, so sin can only be defined in terms of God's rightful authority, His right to rule over us, the laws that He has given to us, and our heart that says, no, I don't want to do it. That, that no is a no to God. That no is a no to God's law. That no is a no to God's ways. You know, I think, for example, of Psalm 2, you know, at the beginning of Psalm 2, why are the nations raging and the peoples devising a vain thing? Uh, they, they, the, the rulers take their stand, the, 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 the kings of the earth, against the Lord and, his, and against His anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart. Let, let, let us uh, rip their cords from us. Why isn't they, they don't like the fetters of God? which is really God and His ways. Why don't they like those? Why do they feel them, why, why do those things feel to them like fetters? Because they don't recognize that those laws that God give lead them to life, but they hate 
those laws. They want to tear them apart. They want to live life their way. So indeed, this is the impulse of sin that has to be re resisted by us who recognize who God truly is. And that sin calls us to go in a direction that will bring ruin to our lives. The only joy there is, is the joy in following the path of righteousness, the path of obedience. You know, Jesus said, uh, these words I speak to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made full. As what? As you hear and follow my word. Not another. There's no other voice, right? My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So indeed, seeing sin as that urge to, to go independent of God makes us realize how important it is to cultivate, what am I going to say next? Your sense of dependence, how much you depend upon God. Here, here's a, here's a takeaway for you. Do you want to grow in dependence in, of God? Grow in prayer. Because what, what does prayer indicate? I need Him. Yes, I mean, yes, yes there is prayer. Uh, pr there are prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Those are part of prayer. But I have in mind particularly supplication, intercessory prayer, where, where we, we recognize we can't do it. We, we need God. So grow in a vibrant praying life to, see, to, to underscore your own dependence upon Him. And then, number two, the most severe consequence of sin is separation from God and all that He is and all that he has. This, I, I, I know many people don't, don't understand this, that separation from God is indeed the most horrific thing that could happen to you. It, 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 it's not paralleled by anything else in human life. No tragedy, no suffering, no sickness, no disease even comes close to the horror of separation from God. Why is that? Well, do you know who God is? Do you know what God possesses? True beauty is in God alone. True joy is in God alone. True truth is in God alone. True righteousness is in God alone. So indeed, God possesses within himself every quality in infinite measure. Everything that is qualitatively good is God's. So do you, do you love beauty? Do you love truth? Do you love goodness? Do, 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 you, do you love wisdom? There's only one place where this resides. It's in God. And you think, well, wait a minute, it's in the world, right? There, there's wisdom. Yeah, but where does that come from? <laughs> it's, 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 the heavens declare the glory of God because the heavens reflect what God put into them, right? It's God's wisdom manifest in physical, visible ways. God's power manifest in physical, visible ways. God's beauty manifest in physical, visible ways. So indeed, God possesses it all. You want to be united to Him, to be separated from Him, as, as uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 speaks about, away from the presence of God and the glory of His power. Is horrifically terrible. So indeed, this is where sin leads. This, I'll do it my way. You know, I think of this as the Frank Sinatra way of life. I did it my way. I, you know, I've heard uh, of people having that sung at their funeral. I want that sung at my funeral. Oh, great. Yeah, that, that, that tells us everything right there. I did it my way. Well, I tell you what, you just need to know this. You do it your way, and you will be lost forever and never know, never know the goodness, the truth, the beauty that is found only in God. You will live in abject misery for all of eternity, away from the presence of God. So this is where sin leads us. Let's be, tr let, let, let's be uh, um, honest about this. This is where sin leads us. And shame on churches that don't tell people this, right? Don't they need to know this? 
so they can see the horror of where they're heading apart from Christ. So indeed, the most severe consequence is separation from God and all that he is and has. What about redemption? Well, so we, we know from the whole Bible, but so many passages tell us God alone can save. God chooses freely to save. And he is an efficacious savior. That is, his method works. You know, other people might think there's a way of salvation. Other religions propose that. But there is only one path of salvation that actually works. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And number two, the honor and the glory due to God for our salvation then is Trinitarian, both in reality and in our own expression. So we give praise to the Father for designing the plan of salvation. He, he's the one who planned and purposed everything that takes place through the Son, through the Spirit. But then the Son is the one who came and died on a cross and rose again for our sins. So we give praise to Jesus for his work on the cross and, and his triumph over sin. And then that saving work only comes to us through the ministry of the Spirit. He applies. So the Father, as it were, is the architect that designs. The Son accomplishes, and the Spirit applies this work. So praise be to the triune God by which our salvation takes place, and apart from it, which there is no salvation. This is the only efficacious salvation there is, is through the work of the triune God to bring this to pass. And then what about God in the new creation? Well, <clears throat> the new creation was the design God had for his people from before creation, original creation. So again, it's not that he created the world and he goes, oh, shucks, it got messed up. I'll, I'll have to do it again. No, <clears throat> the new creation was plan A, <clears throat> but through the means of the original creation, the fall, redemption, and then the greater enhanced, the greater Eden, the greater humanity, the greater Adam. So you, we have this enhanced, glorious new creation that comes that is the plan of God from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Only fulfilled through the pathway of sin and redemption. The most glorious, number two, the most glorious reality of the new creation is being in the presence of God forever. Just think about what we talked about a moment ago. If the most horrible thing possible is to be separated from God, guess what the most glorious thing is? To be with Him, to be in His presence forever. I love John Piper's little book, <clears throat> I've already mentioned one other one to you, Seeing and Savoring Jesus Christ. Uh, get that and read it. But here's another beautiful little book by John Piper. It's another one of his shorter ones. God is the gospel. Don't you love that title? Do you get the point of it? So the gospel isn't good things God gives us, even justification, you know, e even forgiveness of sins. And I mean, those are, those are good things, but that's not the ultimate goal. No, that has, it's sort of like we have to be cleared of our sin, remade to be like Christ so that we can be with him forever and ever, Right? He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us uh, through Jesus Christ to adoption as sons so that we would be His people with Him forever and ever. So indeed, being with Christ is the great good, I mean, with God, and of course, God manifest in Christ through the Spirit is the great good we have for, for the new creation. Okay, so the necessity of a God-encompassing framework. I mean, it is so clear, isn't it, that we've got to have a correct understanding of God and His supremacy, His, his rulership, His sovereignty, uh, His rightful place in uh, having designed us, telling us how we should live, and indeed, that, that alone can account for how the world actually works as God has made it. But we not only need a God-encompassing framework, we need a Christ-centered framework. So Roman numeral two. Think first of creation. Christ, as the agent of the Father in creation, has intrinsic divine authority over all that he has made. Let me stop right there in my sentence that's on your notes. Let me stop there and just think about that with you. So how did creation take place? 
Well, it's very clear that the Father creates through the Son, right? Th- th- hear these words. This is in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. For us there is but one God, the Father. Listen to the prepositions. There is for one God, there is for us one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. You hear it? From the Father, through the Son. Right? Uh, Hebrews 1, God spoke through the prophets in many portions, many ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Listen, through whom, Son, he, Father, made the world. So how, how did the world come into being? Through the agency of the Son. Think, John 1, 1. Oh my goodness, it's just incredible. In the beginning was the Word. Well, in the beginning, what, what immediately comes to your mind? Genesis 1-1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So let me just walk you through this real quickly. So, so you might, if you're thinking, in the beginning, oh, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God. So in the beginning was the Word. Oh, the Word must be God then, right? So the Word created. That, that's what John is doing. He's linking Word with creator of Genesis 1. Well, keep reading. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Oh, Oh, so we shouldn't make that equation between the Word and God of Genesis 1-1 because the Word is with God. So maybe the Word who is with God is not himself God. Oh, keep reading. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So God with God, Word of God with the one we know of as the Father, and it was through the Word that all things are created. So he was in the beginning with God, uh, John, John 1, 2, then John 1, 3. All things came into being by him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Which, by the way, means the Son is not one of the things who could have been brought into being. Because it says, <clears throat> all things came into being by him. And oh, now I just am forgetting how it goes. All things came into being, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So he brought everything into being that has come into being. The Son did. The Word did. Think Genesis 1 again. How did God create? Quite literally, what did he do? He spoke. Then God said. Then God said. Then God said. Then God said. So the Father, by his Word, creates. Isn't that something? So, as the creator, the son, he has intrinsic rights over all. So, why does he say, or why, why is it said of him in Matthew 28, 18, yeah, Jesus says this, all authority in heaven and earth, are you ready? Has been given me. What? How can, he, how can it be given to him, all authority in heaven and earth, when he created everything? And by virtue of being creator, has, a, has rightful intrinsic authority over everything. Answer, the one who says that is not merely the eternal son of the Father. He is the eternal son of the Father who has taken on human nature to become the Messiah, <clears throat> the son of David who has to win the right to reign over all of creation by his obedient life and death and now resurrection. And now he says, all authority has been given me. Therefore, go to the world. Make disciples of all the nations because they're mine. I bought them. You hear it? So indeed, this is the messianic authority of the Son who is over all. Well, we, we, in order to understand the, the ultimate authority of God and the authority that is granted from the Father to the Son in His messianic office, we, we need to have a Christ-centered understanding of this. And then creation, number two, creation in the image of God has in mind from the outset our recreation in the image of Christ as those who with Christ reign over all. It's interesting in the New Testament that statements of of our being remade in the image of God are almost always statements of being remade in the image of Christ, right? So indeed, it it is the very purpose of the Father to grant us the greatest honor you could have 
to be like Jesus, literally, right? I remember in Chicago when we lived there, uh, when I taught at Trinity Divinity School, uh, it was during the years that Michael Jordan returned uh, to the Chicago Bulls. And th those were fun years. Oh, my goodness. I mean, Michael Jordan was hot as could be and making baskets and running up and down and jumping. And I mean, just, just incredible. So uh, there, there was this commercial that ran during uh, the, the playoff season uh, for a couple years there. You might remember it. I want to be like Mike. Be like Mike. Now, isn't that honoring of Michael Jordan, that the whole country can kind of resonate with that. Yeah, I want to be like Mike. Well, how about this? The Father says from eternity past, I want you to be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. What honor there is to the Son and what glory comes to us as He remakes us according to the character of His Son, and there, there's no greater honor to Christ, no greater well-being for us than for this to take place. So this was the design of the Father from the very beginning to be remade ultimately in the greater image, the image of the greater Adam, the greater uh, human, and that is Christ himself. The fall, what about the fall? How does this Christ-centered approach affect our understanding of the fall. Well, the sin of Adam and Eve is the prerequisite for the fulfillment of the Father's purpose. 1 Peter 1.20, that is, he designed the Son to come, but to save, and so there has to be sin there, to save his people through the seed of the woman. So indeed, for Christ to be the exalted one we just talked about, who died and rose and ascends and now is given authority over all things, guess what? It has to be there. Sin. He has to conquer Satan, conquer sin. He has to be the, 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 the Christus victor, the, the victor over the powers of darkness. <clears throat> he has to be the one who purchases his people from their sin in order to be the one who stands above sin and Satan. <clears throat> so indeed, that sin is the plan of the Father but through that, the seed of the woman will come and will bring triumph over that sin. And then secondly, our human lives stand in stark contrast to Jesus' glorious, perfect, sinless human life. So here's another indication of, of how, how important it is to have a Christ-centered understanding of humanity. How do we look in our sin compared to Christ? And the answer is pretty pathetic. I mean, we're, we're, we are the junkyard version of humanity. He is the showroom floor version. Do you see it? See, so we're still human, but oh my, are we marred. Are, are, are we not corrupted in horrid ways that, that distort the image of God? But Christ, the perfect image of God and the one in whose image we will be restored. My goodness, you talk about a reclamation project. It's huge that God is doing with all of us. The junkyard versions being remade like the showroom floor version. Wow, God is doing that. And then redemption, a Christ-centered approach for redemption for obvious reasons, for many reasons. We gladly affirm that Christ is the exclusive Savior. If someone comes up to you and says, why do you believe Jesus is the only way to be saved? Do you have an answer for that? I mean, what about Buddha, you know, or Muhammad, or Confucius, or Lao Tzu? I mean, why, why think that salvation can only come in Christ? Do you have an answer for that? I hope you do. Well, you know, things that should come to our minds are things like, well, Jesus is the only one who was fully God and fully man together. Can a Savior be just a man like Confucius was, just a man like Lao Tzu was, just a man like Muhammad was? And the answer is no. Here, here, here's the reason why. Because if you had just a man, even if he was a perfect man, you know, let, let's give what we shouldn't give on this, but let, let, let's just grant that for the sake of argument. <clears throat> Suppose you had a perfect man who 
substituted himself for us and bore our sin and died in our place for our sin. Would this work? And the answer to the question is no. Do you know why it wouldn't work? Because that man who took our sin and died for our sin would die for our sin the same way we would die for our sin if we died for it ourselves. Which is what? How, how, do, how do we pay for our own sin if we pay for it ourselves? Answer, everlasting condemnation. You never finish paying, so there never would be a, a, a statement, it is finished. There never would be a time when the payment would be made in full by just a man. So what's the difference with Jesus? Jesus. He's the God-man, so the offering that he makes is of infinite value, pays in an instant what we could never pay for for all of eternity. So indeed, Jesus is the only one who is the God-man. Do you know of any other? I don't. I don't know any claims in that regard. No. Here, here's, a, here's another thing that should come to mind when you think, why, why would you claim Jesus is the only Savior? His death on the cross is the only death that was a death for others exclusively. He did not deserve to die. He had committed no sin. There was any deceit found in his mouth. So so Jesus did not die for his own sin. He died for the sin of others. What other person has died for the sin of others? What other person can you say their sin, their death had nothing to do with their own sin? I mean, no matter what you say about how noble Confucius might be or any other person you you, want, nobody is claiming sinlessness of these people. Jesus, though, is sinless. He, he could, he was the only one who qualified to, to offer a substitutionary death, substituting himself for us because he did not deserve the death that he received. He only received it because he took our sin. So indeed, Jesus is the only Savior. We, we need, need to realize this is not just, I don't know, Christian chutzpah, you know, Oh, you Christians, you you think you're so great. No, this is the truth. This is the truth. This is this this is uh, gospel truth that people's salvation depends upon. We cannot sacrifice it. We cannot give it up. So, number two, for our redemption in Christ <clears throat> is to be made like Christ, as we've talked about so many times already. Being made like Christ is the ultimate goal. So indeed, we can't understand really what what the purpose of our redemption is outside of Christ. Not only is, is Christ the one who died for our sin, who saved us, Christ is the one whose death and resurrection made possible us being made like him. So indeed, he's the centerpiece there, Christ-centered. And then in the new creation, we will worship forever the Lamb who was slain to the glory of the Father in the ongoing power of the Spirit. <clears throat> so Christ will be central. I, you know, people ask me sometimes, um, will, will we see God in heaven? And if you mean by that the Father, I think the answer is no. I don't think so. He's spirit. Will we see the Spirit in heaven? No. So who will we see of God in heaven? I think the answer is Jesus. We will see Jesus. We will see, remember how Hebrews describes him though? In Hebrews 1, I think it's verse 3, he's the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. You remember John 14, uh, Philip asked Jesus, says to Jesus, show us the Father. Philip, have you been with me so long? that you don't know that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Yeah, so you, you realize, ah, this is, this is God manifest in a way we can see. Isn't that kind of God to do that? So indeed, we will see Christ, but worship the triune God forever in eternity. And then number two, Christ will forever represent to us the very nature of God his Father, as a way, in the way we just talked about, and <clears throat> true and full human existence lived at its best. So he will be forever the God-man. 
It's not that the incarnation happens for the time that he's on life and then he sheds his humanity. No, no, no. This is, this is the inseparable union of his eternal divine nature now joined with a human nature in the womb of Mary at his conception. And beginning at that point, Jesus as the God-man lives forever. And he lives with the Spirit. You know there is evidence in the New Testament that after the resurrection of Christ that he actually taught in the power of the Spirit. So again, you might think, well, yeah, the Spirit was upon him during his earthly ministry, but it wasn't needed after that. No, not true. So the Spirit, it, we, we read this in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 2, where he said to Theophilus, um, after he had uh, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, spoken these words to the apostles whom he had chosen. He's talking about the Great Commission. So here's the resurrected Christ who, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, Luke includes that phrase in Luke 1, verse 2. After he had, by the Holy Spirit, spoken these words to the disciples whom he had chosen. So indeed, the Spirit is still upon Jesus because he's the Messiah, he's a human and so spirit empowerment, as we will have the spirit upon us forever. Okay, then finally, uh, new creation. Uh, we, no, 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 we did the new creation. So finally, number, Roman numeral three, we move on to the last major heading here. The necessity not only of a God-encompassing framework and a Christ-centered framework, but a gospel-dependent framework for a correct understanding of human nature. So in creation, grace begins there. What is grace? Unmerited favor. To be given life is grace. To be given breath is grace, right? To, to be brought into being is grace. So grace is not associated only with God's favor to sinners. Of course, it is most of the time in the Bible, but it's also the undeserved favor of God shown to Adam in the garden. Here, here, here's an example of it. Of all the trees of the garden, you may freely eat. We talked about this. How kind and benevolent and generous God was. He wasn't stingy. Adam, be careful now. Don't eat too much. You know, no, you could, you, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of trees out here that look glorious, but you can have this one. No, you can have all of them except this one. That was the generous, benevolent expression of a gracious God. And then number two, such compassion in giving to man the moral commandment, warning him of certain destruction for eating the tree. The warnings of God are evidences of his grace. It's like the analogy I used yesterday of the father who builds this huge playground for his kids, and, and he says, but don't play in the street. That's not mean. That's not withholding. That's gracious to preserve them from harm. So indeed, this is God in his mercy, his grace, his kindness to Adam before sin to provide so generously and to protect, to warn so lovingly. But indeed, Adam failed. So the fall, capital letter B, the fall can we ever cease to praise God that in the very moment of our sinful rebellion, which plunged the human race and cosmos into disorder and destruction, God pledges a seed who will undo the vicious work of the devil? Can we ever stop praising God for this, thanking God for this? You know, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die, right? Genesis 1. I'm sorry, Genesis 2. The day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Satan says, says to them, you will not die. Well, doesn't it sort of look like Satan was right? They didn't die, right? She, she, in fact, you know, he names, he, he, he names his wife Eve, mother of all the living. Yeah, so he, she's living on and, and she's going to give birth to those who, who ultimately will, will come down to the Messiah, the, the, the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. So, so he, here, here's how I understand this, that when, when God said the day that you eat of it, you will surely die, here's what that means. It means not just spiritual death. I, I, I don't accept that as an answer, as a full answer. It's a partial answer. Yes, there is spiritual death that takes place in the garden, <clears throat> seen by separating from God and so on. I mean, that's all clear. They know they're naked and they're ashamed. I mean, all that's clear. There's spiritual death. But in, in Romans 5, 
death is physical death. Romans 5 verse 12, through one man sin entered the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sin, this is physical death he's talking about. So what physical death might have happened to Adam and his wife the moment they sinned? I think this is it. They, something happened in their physiology, in the chemistry of their body, where they began at that moment a dying process that I'm in, most of you are in. I think, what, what is it, age maybe 17 or 18, something like that right around there, uh, where you quit growing and you start declining, right? You're, you, pe- you reach the peak and you're on, you're on the way down, friends, uh, mo- mo- most of you, most of you. I see, I see a few up here that are on the way up still, you know, but uh, <clears throat> most of us in this room are on the way down. It's just I'm a little ahead of you, you know, that's all, at, uh, at my 67 years old, but behind some of you. But here, here's the thing, so the, the dying process began right there. They would not have moved to dying had it not been for their sin. But now they move inevitably, inexorably, to death at the moment they sin. This begins it. So I think, I think there is physical death tied to their action, but wasn't it merciful, merciful of God to do it that way? Kind of the already not yet idea, right? So death, death the sentence of death is given right there but the fullness of it doesn't come for many hundreds of years, as we know from how long Adam lived. Wasn't it merciful of God to do it that way? So that the woman could keep living to be Eve, the mother of all the living, the mother who would give birth to to a child uh, and to children who then would have other, who who would give rise to this whole lineage of people who would ultimately come down to the Messiah. How gracious of God to do it that way. He didn't just end the human race when they sinned, which he very well could have done. He would be in his rights to do so. But he did it in a way in which death begins, but they, can, they continue living in order to bring about the, the Messiah ultimately. Um, And then number two, number two under the fall, may we never forget the horrors and consequences of our sin. To the extent we forget, we fail to understand and appreciate the glories of the gospel by which we are saved. So it's not that you should become morose, you know, just dwell on your sin all the time, but here's what we should do. Think about it deeply from time to time. From time to time, remind yourself, what was your destiny apart from grace? Remind yourself how incapable you are in your, uh, on your own to do anything about your own sin. I love the phrase in Psalm 2 where at the end of the psalm when he's warning Take warning, O kings of the earth. And he, and he says, kiss the son lest you die. Uh, rejoice with trembling. Rejoice with trembling. So you rejoice over the fact that you have kissed the son, you have come and you've received forgiveness and you're now under the, the, the reign of the conquering king as you bow and kiss the son who defeated the sin that had encompassed you. So you rejoice at that, but you rejoice with trembling. Why do you tremble? Because you never forget where you were heading, what would have been your destiny. How horrid was your condition. You never forget that. As, as you then again give praise to God for his mercy, for delivering you for your sin. I think this is why in the end, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we talked about this in the previous session. You know, we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Why do that? I think God wants us to know, in a way we never know in this life, the fullness of our sin 
All of it put on display. I don't know if that's public or private. I don't know. God will do it right. But it's put on display for us to see. And, and we know how horrid our sin was as we enter into eternal joy and bliss. Seeing the greatness of our, of our redemption in part because we see the horror of our sin. So let's remind ourselves of that regularly. Don't become morose, but oh, don't forget. <clears throat> Redemption. The good news of the gospel is Christ's death and resurrection by which the penalty of our sin is paid and the guilt is removed, bringing forth the reality of justification by faith. So again, we've got to have a gospel-centered view to understand rightly what it means to be saved people. It means Christ has done everything. We do nothing. He does it all, and we receive by faith, apart from works, the gift of His forgiveness, and with that, the gift of justification, the declaration of the Father that our sins are forgiven, and therefore we no longer stand before God guilty of the condemnation we deserved. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Third verse, was it, of it is well with my soul? Uh, I think this is the second verse. When Satan tempts me to despair... And Satan tempts me to despair, and I, help me, when Satan tempts me to despair, and I, I what? And, and tell, thank you, and tells me of the guilt within, thank you, Amy, and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look, oh my, I'm just, now it's just not coming like it should, um, <laughs> upward I look and see him there, who put an end to all my sin. Um, <laughs> why did I go this route? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. My sinful, now okay, help me again. Oh. Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because my sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is propitiated, satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Wow. Wow. I'm sorry I messed that up so terribly, but the truth of it is just glorious. It is glorious. So indeed, our justification comes about through what Christ has done. But secondly, the good news of the gospel is also, don't leave it there. It's not just justification. The good news of the gospel is also Christ's death and resurrection by which the power of sin is conquered and his bondage over us is destroyed, bringing forth the reality, uh, the reality of transformation in sanctification leading to the glory of our full new creation. So the two gifts that we receive in salvation that relate to our being is justification, no more guilt, and sanctification, no more pollution, right? Ultimately, ultimately through the sanctification process, glorification, uh, our natures are changed. So indeed, all of it accomplished by Christ. And then finally, new creation, what grace and power is ours forever, our everlasting obedience is not automatic, but Christ bought and spirit wrought. So, Ezekiel 36, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You will be careful to observe my ordinances. Do you know where that is fulfilled in its fullness? In heaven. In heaven, where we by the spirit are moved 
constantly to love the ways of God, to long to obey God. We will, we will say as Jesus said, it is my food to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. I mean, we, we will long to obey out of Christ-bought, spirit-wrought obedience that will be ours forever. Never, ever again sinning. Hard to believe, isn't it? Well, that day is coming. And then finally, what joy and gladness is ours forever, our everlasting service will fulfill God's design for our living as the image of Christ reigning with Him forever. So purpose, significance, work that is meaningful, if fulfilling in heaven forever. This is ours because of the good news of the gospel that has brought us gracious transformation, gracious remaking into the likeness of Christ and gracious reigning with Christ forever and ever. So indeed, we need to have God, Christ, gospel in our minds as we think who we are as human beings to understand rightly. May God help us to see His design, embrace it, praise God for it, and commend it to others because it is good. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time, this, this uh, morning, both our earlier session and, and now, to think through just so many glorious truths that relate to who we are as human beings and how we should live. Uh, take take uh, these truths, Lord, and bring them home to our own hearts also, that we not only think differently, but we feel and, and, uh, and worship in new ways because of your gracious uh, gift to us of human life redeemed in Christ, and what's ahead for us forever. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.